Welcome back to the playlist on biosignaling. Um, this is going to be a really important video to see um, if you really want to see how uh, the G protein, G protein signaling works. So what we've been seeing in the past couple of videos is we saw that you know you have some neurotransmitter or hormone that binds to the G protein coupled receptor. And of course the G protein coupled receptor activates the alpha subunit of the G protein. And see, when we have this big idea that the G protein has a, has an, a, a ligated GTP, and when the G protein alpha subunit has that GTP, it's able to dissociate from the G protein regulatory subunits, beta and gamma, and it goes over to this enzyme called adenylate cyclase. And see, whenever this G protein with bound GTP binds to adenylate cyclase, it activates it. Okay, so basically what we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at the mechanism of adenylate cyclase. We're also going to see a product that comes off of it that's not cyclic AMP called pyrophosphate or inorganic pyrophosphate. And it turns out that something that helps to drive work in the cell is to actually hydrolyze the inorganic pyrophosphate through an enzyme called inorganic pyrophosphatase. So I thought it would be really good to put these two guys in the same video. That way we can simplify things. Okay, so the big idea is that the G protein alpha subunit with bound GTP binds to and basically allosterically activates adenylate cyclase. And so the, the net reaction of this enzyme is to take adenosine triphosphate, which is shown right here. So it takes ATP and it converts it to this molecule right here, which is called 3 prime 5 prime cyclic adenosine monophosphate or 3 prime 5 prime cyclic AMP. In the process of doing this reaction, we basically spit off this guy, which is called inorganic pyrophosphate. And inorganic pyrophosphate has an enzyme that can react with it called inorganic pyrophosphatase, which is a hydrolytic enzyme. And it hydrolyzes the pyrophosphate into two phosphate molecules. And we'll see shortly how that works. One thing I wanted to mention about that particular reaction is it is associated with a very negative delta G. So the delta G standard of this reaction is far less than zero. In other words, what we're saying is this reaction is highly exergonic. And so what exergonic implies is that you get a release of free energy. And it turns out that that release of free energy that's done through this mechanism is actually what is used to drive work in the cell. And actually, one of the main reasons why it's so exergonic is because we're ultimately getting an increase in entropy with this reaction. Okay, so without boring you any further, let's actually look at the mechanism to see how it's done. Okay, so we're first going to look at adenylate cyclase, and we have this ATP that comes into the active site. Now, some important things about this, and an interesting thing at that, is that there are actually no amino acids that do any direct catalysis. Now, we do have amino acids that can stabilize the intermediate, but there's actually no amino acids that play a role in catalysis. This is a, this is a version of autocatalysis that takes place within the active site, and we'll see how that works in just a minute. Also, there are some magnesiums here in the active site. Magnesium is automatically divalent um, just when it ionizes. It's an alkaline earth metal, so it likes to have a plus two charge, and it turns out there are two important ones in the active site. They are held in place by aspartate residues. I haven't shown those here for simplicity, but aspartate residues hold these magnesiums in the active site. And the whole purpose of having these here is two reasons. Number one, you see how these phosphates have negative charges on them? Well, these negative charges like to form electrostatic interactions, which I'll draw in yellow, electrostatic interactions with the magnesiums. Okay, And that helps stabilize the incoming adenosine triphosphate into the active site. The other thing the magnesiums do, and we'll, we'll look into why that is in just a minute, but it effectively increases the nucleophilicity of this oxygen right here. So in the, um, in the protonated hydroxyl group form, this oxygen really is not very good at being a nucleophile. But see, if we were to somehow deprotonate this oxygen, it would become a much better nucleophile. And the magnesiums actually play a role 
in making a better nuclear file. Let's actually look to see why that is. I'm going to simplify the structure a little bit, but basically I'll have this ribose ring, right, that's part of ATP, and if we were to deprotonate that oxygen, we would generate this alkoxide, right? And alkoxides we know are much better nucleophiles, okay? And it turns out that the way we deprotonate it, and I'll draw the mechanistic steps in green, is this alpha phosphate right here, this is the alpha phosphate, its oxygen with the negative charge is going to deprotonate this hydroxyl group. It's going to deprotonate here, and that will split this bond right here. And so the resulting alkoxide will then do a nucleophilic attack on this phosphorus atom of the alpha phosphate, and that generates what we call a trigonal bipyramidal intermediate. Now notice that phosphorus is one of those strange atoms below the second period that can violate the octet rule. So even at rest, it has five bonds, four sigma, one pi, and it's already tetrahedral in geometry. So when we generate the next step intermediate, it goes up one hybridization to trigonal bipyramidal, and that intermediate is shown right here in the next step. Okay, so notice what we did is we made another ring. It's an intermediate, but it's a ring adjacent to this ribose ring. And just like in the case of tetrahedral intermediates that you see in protein degradation, this trigonal bipyramidal intermediate will now collapse. Okay, it'll collapse and reform the phosphonyl bond, the oxygen-phosphorus double bond. So this reforms, reforms the pi bond, and effectively what you have to do is kick off a leaving group. Okay, and it turns out that the leaving group that comes off is this pyrophosphate over here. So the part that I'm going to circle in yellow, this is all what will be the pyrophosphate. So all this business over here, this is pyrophosphate. And of course, at the end of this reaction sequence, we get three prime, five prime cyclic adenosine monophosphate, and we get inorganic pyrophosphate. And this cyclic AMP, if you've been following the videos, this cyclic AMP is actually what goes and basically causes release of protein kinase A from the protein kinase A regulatory protein subunits. Because remember, those regulatory subunits have a vice grip on protein kinase A, right? And they hold it in place and don't allow PKA to do any catalysis. But as soon as cyclic AMP, two of them bind to each regulatory subunit, that the regulatory subunit loosens its grip on protein kinase A, and protein kinase A can then do its catalysis. So cyclic AMP is very important for activation of protein kinase A, and then protein kinase A then goes and phosphorylates um, intracellular target proteins. Okay? But now we have this inorganic pyrophosphate, and I want to sort of think about what that's going to do. Because inorganic pyrophosphate is of no use to us, Okay, so if we had like ATP synthase, that cannot react with inorganic pyrophosphate because ATP synthase is specific for adenosine diphosphate and simple inorganic phosphate. So somehow we've got to get this into a form in which we can readily use it. And the way we're going to do that is through inorganic pyrophosphatase. So what we're going to do now is look at that mechanism. Okay, so here's the molecule inorganic pyrophosphate. And this is a hydrolase. So there's going to be a base in the active site. Again, I'll do the mechanistic steps in green. There's a base in the active site which will deprotonate water. Okay, And when water gets deprotonated, it's going to attack this phosphorus atom. And that's going to effectively force a nucleophilic acyl substitution. But since phosphate is already tetrahedral, it'll go up one hybridization over here to a trigonal bipyramidal intermediate, just like we saw in the case of adenylate cyclase in any ATP hydrolytic mechanism. So now you have this trigonal bipyramidal intermediate, which will now collapse back down to form the phosphonyl bond, and that will kick off the leaving group, which is this phosphate over here on the right side. But as it's leaving, it's going to re-abstract the proton from that base that did the original deprotonation. And so what you end up getting over here are two inorganic phosphates. And like we mentioned earlier, when we, when we looked at the general reaction, wherever that was, uh, remember that inorganic pyrophosphatase 
is associated with a very, very negative delta G, which just means that there's a tremendous release of free energy that's used to drive work in the cell, and that's very important for the cell to continue to go. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on adenylate cyclase and inorganic pyrophosphatase. See you in the next video.